Good morning to this lecture number 11 of our online course on big data and artificial intelligence in material science. Today we have a January 28, 2021, and the topic of my lecture is subgroup discovery. The plan of the presentation follows very much the same structure as we had it in most of the other lectures during the last uh, two or three months. And that means uh, we have two parts. We start with uh, a part one, an introduction to subgroup discovery. And uh, I will discuss here mainly the general concepts. Then in section B, I will uh, describe uh, a comparison between subgroup discovery and decision trees. Because of two reasons. One reason is that decision trees have been discussed before in a lecture by Daniel Speckhardt. And they are easy and, and, and I, I feel well understood. But they also use a language which is somewhat similar to the language which we are using in subgroup discovery. Nevertheless, the concept and the goal of the, of the two methods and concepts are very different. In 1C, uh, I may discuss one, maybe actually two, that depends a little bit on, on, on the time, uh, how we are going, examples from material science. And we finish part one with a Q&A question and answers session and a short bio break. After that, we continue with part two, where I initially describe what is called the Kegel uh, um, competition. Kegel is a machine learning platform which has been bought by Google about two years ago. It's a very interesting concept and I feel you may like to learn about that a little bit and maybe also using it at some point. But we have actually used that for looking into transparent semiconductors. So we initiated a competition there, which was very successful. And I'm not only showing it because I feel you may be interested in the concept of Kegel, but also because uh, the results, uh, the, the models which have been used there and the data which we had provided for this are used then in section 2B uh, called the domain of applicability of machine learning models. And again, we finish with a Q&A uh, session. If you have questions, please write them down into the chat. Or in the Q&A sessions, you may also simply unmute your microphone and talk. But whenever you have a question, it may be actually a good idea to just write them down as well. So let me now continue and uh, go to the uh, lifted desk, which I can use for writing. Typically, data sets are composed of very heterogeneous data. That is data that are governed by different physical or chemical mechanisms. Now, you know that, I mean, there are superconductors which are governed by correlation and electron, uh, electron correlation and maybe electron phonon interaction. Uh, in the classical sense, there is a uh, electron conductivity in semiconductors is governed by electrons or holes and the effective masses of the band structure and so on. Uh, and magnetism uh, is, is, is another phenomenon. There, there, there are so many phenomena and so many different mechanisms. So the question somehow is, should we really look at all these data? Now machine learning fits all the data with one model. For any input, it gives an answer. This is somewhat the idea uh, that you would say, uh, okay, machine learning is learning the whole many body Schrodinger equation and maybe also the statistical mechanics. And then of course, one model would do that. That would be the Schrodinger equation and statistical mechanics. But uh, in general, I think you don't have enough information to get even close to that. So the clear question is, which we are 
addressing in this talk is, uh, does it make really sense to do so, to fit all the data with one model? One fits all, is that a good strategy in science? And again, as I said, for describing, as an example, the conductivity of semiconductors, does it make sense to consider bulk 3D transition metals? And uh, we would argue, typically, it does not make sense to do so. Now, of course, in many cases, you know the, you, you know the mechanism, and that's why in many cases, you know what materials you should select for a certain property. But looking ahead, you may also say we want to find new mechanisms and we should be very careful with our prejudice and consider as many possibilities as there are. That is what machine learning does or that is what global models are doing. So you have in a simple coordinate system uh, an x-axis which describes the material. So this is a set of parameters uh, which identify which material and what function we are looking at. It is, um, of course, not a one-dimensional thing. I plotted one-dimensional. There are many, many aspects behind these descriptive set of parameters, also called features or primary features in machine learning. And of course, the other axis would be the property axis. This is what is measured or what is uh, calculated, like, for example, conductivity. And in this coordinate system, we have data points as noted down here. A global fit would look at all the data together, try to fit them with a certain model and uh, or model class, and uh, also including, of course, regularization uh, to make sure that we are not going exactly through the points, but but have a good compromise so that the fit and the generalization is in fact uh, fulfilled. This is what we want. We want, in fact, not an ideal exact fit. We want also that if we take some data hours and try to predict them, that at least the interpolation is as good as possible. And that is why a global fit or machine learning fit would look like this one. It just gives the best fit for all the data. Now assume in the spirit of what I've said before, that we have more information, or actually there is more information, maybe we don't know about it, but assume there is more information that, for example, some points are red and some points are blue. Then, of course, uh, the yellow model would not really give the right uh, physical description. The physical fit would be the red and the blue lines here. That means local models should be used uh, and hopefully to identify these, that, that these points are really belonging together. In this case, when, when we know these are red and blue points, this is obvious. But in fact, we want to use artificial intelligence, or in this case, subgroup discovery, to give us this idea that there is some com commonality in, in, in these points, even if we don't know that they are red and blue. Can we identify local structures in general? Now, I don't want to sound as if uh, global models are not good. I mean, they are good. I mean, both things are good for their own purpose. Global models are, for example, the classic example is self driving cars, where we need an answer for any input. That means for any situation the car can encounter, we need one and only one answer. And you see on this coordinate system here, if we are somewhere on the x-axis, we have one answer on the yellow, on, on the yellow predictive uh, um, line. This is not the case if uh, we have uh, local models, right? Because then you see here, for example, for this x, you get this and this, and you don't really know uh, if it would be a self-driving car, what, what the car should really do. In science, you would know actually these are different uh, situations and systems which you should treat differently. Now, this yellow situation, self-driving cars, global models, we call predictive induction. One area of machine learning, of, of uh, 
um, artificial intelligence. And in general, of course, if we want scientific discoveries, the situation is different. We like to achieve insight and also understanding. This is a different route, and that is called descriptive induction. Let me write this down again uh, to make this difference really very clear. In data mining, which is one of the umbrella terms, or another umbrella term would be data analytics, or another umbrella term would be artificial intelligence, which is the name we have used for our uh, uh, lecture course. In, in, in these in these fields we have predictive induction that means predict a result with high confidence and that is also i think described in terms of being an interpolation machine learning and global models get better the more data you have because the better then the interpolation will work better and they give one answer and uh, for for every question you asked the model. Descriptive induction means extract knowledge from the data, ultimately achieve understanding. Not just learning, but also understanding. Subgroup discovery, which is the topic of today's talk, is somewhere in between. In a clean way, one has to say subgroup discovery is a descriptive induction technique to identify potentially useful and ultimately understandable patterns in data sets. But as it identifies patterns and it identifies also the characteristic uh, parameters which determine these patterns, in fact, it is also predictive. Because if you look at the pattern, we know that not only the data which we have, which are in this pattern in the certain group, but also other data which we don't know yet, if they would be in this position, they would have the same or yeah, the same property. So this figure you have seen already, I've shown that in the very first talk of our lecture series. Um, and maybe you will now understand a little bit the motivation behind creating it. In this huge deluge of data, there are areas where if we can arrange them properly, there are areas where we find topological insulators or actually metals or topological insulators. And uh, the idea of subgroup discoveries is to help us in finding these different areas. Now we had also pointed out in the uh, very first talk that the number of possible materials is practically infinite. And that means, and that is here in red, there is no way to cover this whole data space directly, directly by high throughput screening computations or high throughput screening experiments. And also machine learning, which is essentially interpolating uh, uh, the experimental or theoretical results, has a high risk in missing what is important. The key issue is that the interesting materials are very few. They are statistically exceptional. That means if you're looking for a good catalyst for a certain chemical reaction in this infinite number of possible materials, there's just a handful of good candidates. If you're looking for systems which have a very high, say, thermal conductivity, and at the same time are also very hard, again, there are very few materials that would classify. So in order to find these materials, we are dealing with what I had called the problem of finding a needle in a haystack. Now let me qualify that example a little bit because we're not just looking for the needle in a haystack, we are looking for many needles in a haystack. In fact, we're not exactly knowing what we are looking for. We are looking for something valuable in the haystack. It could be needles, it could be 
coins, it could be nuggets or what have you. And we're looking for data groups, for groups of materials in this huge amount of hay. We're looking for groups which follow a certain design or physical principle. And again, this is why uh, uh, subgroup discovery helps us in looking through the hay or through the infinite number of materials and then finding uh, a descriptor D2 here or D1 here. And descriptor means descriptive, physical, meaningful parameters. Finding parameters in a higher dimensional space, this is just two dimensional, but in principle it will be a much higher dimensional space. Finding parameters that uh, if I plot the materials properties in this space of coordinates, we will find areas where we know here are good materials for photovoltaics, here are good transparent metals and so on. This is the goal, which I think is specific certainly for material science, but maybe also for other fields. But of course, we are interested here in material science. So let me continue with writing more on the board. So here we have an example, just a tutorial uh, uh, introduction to subgroup discovery, an example of data points uh, as a function of two X values. That means the descriptive set of parameters describing our material, x1 and here x2. And for every x1, x2, we have a data point. And if you look carefully, these data points are squares and circles. And so, so the property y can have the value a or the value b, where a means circle and b means square. You could say this means metal and or, uh, conducting and, 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 and insulating could be actually one possibility. Uh, or it could be two different structures, uh, a vault side structure or a rock salt structure. So these are just a very simple explain, uh, example of having two materials, data set, uh, characteristic parameters and two properties which every material could have being either one or the other one. So given a data set, that means um, a sample. So this is what we call sample. So the, the points where we have done the measurements or the calculations, these points are sample. They are typically a subgroup, a sub, subgroup of uh, the full population. Um, as, as we never have actually everything measured, but in principle, of course, you could. So giving a data set, as you see here, but there are many white spots and there are different additional materials at these white spots. Given a data set, uh, how can we, in fact, work with this? We have feature descriptive parameters, as I mentioned, the x1 and x2. And that means every material from our population is identified by an x1 and x2 value. We also have properties. Every material x1 and x2 has one property y, uh, where y can have the value a or the value b, circle or square. Global models classify the whole space. And we have discussed that before. Uh, we minimize an error. Uh, so we have a prediction y of this xi vector. I, there's not actually every point, and uh, x hat and regularization. This should be minimized. And uh, one example in doing this. would be decision trees. And let me first explain uh, why decision trees are in fact a global model, although they have the same language uh, to some extent at least as we have it later in subgroup discovery. So in decision trees, we um, look at these data sets 
uh, and I should actually have said that before. So in this example, uh, we're dealing what is called categorization or classification, having integer this or this. You could, in this case, we have two examples, circles and squares, but you could have actually also many other properties, in particular, if you go to more crystal structures, for example. So we have data, and uh, if you look carefully, uh, if you want, but you can also just believe me, these are 975 data points, and from these 975 data points, 474 are circles, and uh, 501 are squares. In machine learning, you remember uh, we have identified the model or the majority class in, in, in a data set by the Gini index, uh, or you can say also the quality uh, by the Gini index. Um, and um, the Gini index, just to remind you, is a measure of inequality or the measure of purity. How many circles compared to squares do we have? Uh, it is given by for every region, in this case, a region, we only have one, so the I is actually not existing if you want, but later it, it will. Uh, in, in this region, which we see here, it's a uh, probability or the percentage of finding a circle times one minus this probability, plus the probability of finding a square times one minus this probability. And if you just calculate this from the numbers uh, which I've noted here, uh, you get the Gini index is 4.996. That means uh, we have a little bit more squares than we have circles. Now, in, um, in, in decision trees, we would immediately then say uh, this data set which we here have belongs to the majority class uh, uh, squares. And now we can continue and, and say, can we uh, uh, split this? Uh, uh, and, and you may remember the, the talk by Daniel Speckerts, you, you, you split by straight lines if you do decision trees, and you ask what is the best split to improve on this uh, Gini index. And what you find is if you would have an X1 at 0.489, which is the one which I've just also plotted here, uh, then you have on the left side a little bit more circles now than squares, and on the right side, you have more squares than circles. So if the condition is true that X1 is smaller than 0.486, uh, then our uh, results are that we have, of course, less data, only roughly half of it, 468 data. Uh, we have more circles than squares in this left region, 258 compared to 210 squares. And the Gini index is now 4.947. So not much better, uh, but actually it is much better because it was before it was a Gini index on the majority class squares. Now it's actually the Gini index uh, on the majority class uh, uh, circles. So we are now circle rich on the left side. That is what we really wanted to see. And if it, condition is false, then we are on the right side. And there we have uh, a majority of squares. So the majority class of this uh, field is squares and the Gini index is 0.4891, which now we can compare it to the, to, the, to, the, to the upper part, which is now at least visibly better than what we had before. So we can continue and now ask uh, what would be uh, the best splitting if we have a splitting somewhere here or if she is splitting somewhere here. And uh, if you do this, what you find is the values should be uh, as, as noted here. I, I've, I've written it down on the next transparency again. Uh, so the decision tree looks like this. We started in what we have discussed. Uh, we then go to, to this uh, majority class A, which was circles, majority class B, which is squared. And again, splitting these according to the best 
uh, option, uh, which are the numbers which you calculate in the splitting conditions, you come down to class A and the Gini index of 0.45, 9, and uh, majority class B, majority class B, and again majority class A. Now you could continue uh, doing some splitting uh, in the decision tree, and, and, and uh, that would in fact look as I've plotted it here with the white lines here and, and here. You would get better and lower Gini indexes. You want to reduce the Gini index in decision trees, but in fact you would not get a better fit if you um, as, as you remember, uh, do this cross-validation, uh, the, the generalization, the prediction, you will see actually you're not getting better on, on this level. So to some extent for the systems of data which we have, this is what you show here, see here as, as, as a decision tree, probably the best you can do in these X1 and X2 parameters. So further splitting gives rise to overfitting. That means a better fit to some extent, but uh, bad for generalization. This is what you can do to identify uh, regions where uh, uh, you may actually get a better description, a better uh, uh, a chance to find materials which are classified by these circles or regions where you find materials which are classified by these squares. So this is again a slide which you have seen before, except that I changed the picture in the result of the decision tree. Models, global models, classify the whole space. You now know in the whole space that uh, uh, you have a certain probability to find circles or squares. But it's not really extremely convincing because the uh, mixture is still somewhat similar. Subgroup discovery focuses on statistically exceptional regions and not really looking into uh, this uh, general thing, but zooming directly into what is statistically exceptional. And this you see here, and I show you two examples. Uh, subgroup discovery focuses on local observations. So what does it mean? And you see this in principle immediately if you look at these data points, which are now gray, uh, because I wanted to highlight some other things. You see with your eye directly uh, that in fact the special regions are not really given by these squares of the decision tree, but they're given here below. I mean, here you have a region which is red, which is only circles, and here you have a region which is only uh, uh, squares. And you could ask, isn't this something special? Is there a way that we can identify and find these things systematically? You also see the conditions uh, of, of this, uh, which is called uh, uh, conjunction. Um, so this is, is a type of Boolean conditions. If X1 of the data point is in this region between 24 and 71, and if X2 is smaller, so, sorry, bigger than 0.9, then we have this region which is noted blue. Or if um, this is the other situation, x1 of the data point is an element of this range, 0.26 to 0.7, and x2 is smaller than 0.1, then we have the red region. Now with your eye, in this tutorial example, you see it immediately, in particular if I put these things in red and blue, the purpose of subgroup discovery is to find these things automatically in complex data sets. So as we said before, our language is we have a sample. These are our data points, which are part of a full bigger population. We have a target value, which in our case here is A and B. So in this case, we don't have a C and so on, but we have target values, either A or either B. And we have features, which are these data sets which describe our uh, material. And the feature uh, identifies really the data points. Each member of the population is identified by an X1 and X2. And we now construct propositions, uh, which are due to uh, Boolean conditions, uh, propositions which 
are uh, which are boolean conditions which which are and, and, and at the end we want a combination of different propositions giving us identifying for us the subgroups so what we are doing is we also have to optimize uh, similar as, 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 as uh, in, the, in the spirit, at least as we do it in, in decision trees, we have to optimize a function. Q is our desired subgroup, uh, where we say this should be a product of the coverage. Coverage means somewhat the, the number of elements in this subgroup and the effect which we are interested in. I come to this in a second. So Q is, uh, uh, is, is also called extension, uh, is uh, the, the subgroup, uh, which is the, the, the elements of, of our sample where the selection language, the conjunction is true. And we have the coverage, that is the number of elements in Q divided uh, by the number of elements of our sample. And the reason why we have this is that we want special groups of data. We don't want individual data. So in principle, if you really don't have also the request that you want to have it under these other conditions as big as possible, you would also find, in fact, too many isolated points and that wouldn't really help very much. And as an effect, we use here, you could also use other things. We use here what is called the information gain, which is the entropy. Of, uh, of, of our sample minus the entropy of our subgroup divided just for normalization, uh, uh, the entropy of our subgroup. Uh, sorry, of our sample, sorry. S is the sample and Q is our subgroup. So this is the, this is the effect which we want to optimize that this information gain is, uh, is, is, is best uh, where these H quantities uh, are what is called the entropy. Uh, I think I have this on the next slide again. Actually, I have it on the next plus one slide again. I, I show you this in a moment. So if you do this the way I've just described it, you would in fact find uh, several of these subgroups. Let me just go back again. You find in fact, with these conditions, you will find this subgroup, which we have here, in blue and, and red. And you find with the same condition also other subgroups, but which are not as clean, as pure as this one, uh, these ones. You also find this subgroup where you see uh, you have a, basically a square where for clear, clearly the majority is squares, but you have some circles as well. And here are again these Boolean conditions on the x and x1 and x2 values. And you have a range here which is also largely squares, but has also some circles. So you find subgroups uh, which are 100% clear, maybe, but typically you find subgroups which are maybe only 80 or 90% clear or clean, and uh, certainly a significant difference to what we had before. Now, I already said, actually, we have here uh, the information gain which we're using, which is again very similar to what we are doing in decision trees. The information gain of a data set of a subgroup or in decision trees you would call this of a node. Um, that means in the subgroup in fact we call it entropy, in the node we call it the Gini index. They are similar but actually also different. Entropy in information theory is analogous to entropy in thermodynamics, where it signifies in simple ways uh, the degree of disorder. And you could say uh, you want to minimize the negative entropy or you maximize the entropy. In decision trees, we usually use uh, as information gain splitting uh, things by, by the, the, the data sets by straight lines and minimizing the so-called uh, Gini index. Now, what is, oops, okay. What is uh, the Gini index and what is uh, the entropy? Uh, we had this already, we used that when, when I uh, used uh, 
the decision tree example, this Gini index is the probability to find uh, the property y equals v. So to find the property, for example, being circle times one minus property of finding a circle plus the other things going through all the properties which are possible, in our case, only two. The entropy looks different. It looks really like the entropy in, in thermodynamics, I would say. It's a sum, again, the probability or the percentage to find uh, a data point which has a value y equals uh, new. We go to all possibilities new and the logarithm uh, of, of, of the same probability. I've written down here the logarithm too, but in fact, one also uses other logarithms. It doesn't really matter at the end uh, if you lose, use uh, the natural or the, uh, uh, the, the base 10 logarithms. Uh, the entropy as noted down here is called also the Shannon entropy. And in this figure, I've shown you how these entropies look like or the Gini index look like. So this is the probability, the percentage to find a circle, the percentage to find a square. Uh, the Gini index goes, if it's a pure material from zero, this would be 50% mixing to pure material. So only circles here, only squares here. And the entropy is somewhat similar. It goes, uh, it, it just has a different uh, uh, height. If it's logarithm two, it goes to the value of one. As the uh, number doesn't really matter, um, I would say it's, it's a matter of taste, what, 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 whatever you prefer. Um, in subgroup discovery, using the entropy as uh, using the Shannon entropy, or in fact related quantities to the Shannon entropy are very usual. usual. So again, P is the probability or the percentage to find the property new in a certain subgroup of a node. If a subgroup or a node has only one class of data, that is only circle, then it's called pure. And then entropy and Gini index have the same value, namely zero. Otherwise, they just have slightly have different values. So again, uh, the difference between subgroup discovery and uh, uh, decision trees is on the left side, well, our decision tree example, where we classify and or, uh, or, or separate uh, the whole space. And we can say for every region, how much is it on the rich side of spheres, the circles or the rich side of squares. For subgroup discovery, we immediately focus on something which is very special. Uh, on, on very local regions. And we can only say these are local regions, uh, which are in this case, uh, having a certain information gain entropy. Uh, uh, here clearly circle rich and here clearly uh, square rich. But we don't really argue about anything else. And in fact, we will get many subgroups, which we then have to analyze and look in what is scientifically interesting. This was a uh, subgroup discovery if we would use um, the classification uh, 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 topic being sphere or circle. Let me now go to an example where we have in fact really a continuous property. So again, uh, our material property is called Y and our descriptors are called X. In this case, uh, we have now a y-axis. So now this is the property, and this is the, the x-axis. And we have x1 going from 0 to 1, and then we have a lot of data points. If you just look at these data points, and you would not really distinguish that they are, if you remember, um, if you look closely, uh, circles and, and, and squares, you could do a fit of all the data points. And the fit which you see here is done by Gaussian progression. Uh, you would get a fit of, of this full black curve with some uh, variance which is given by the dashed curves. A reasonable fit, some people may say, actually I would say it's not really very good, but this is a fit which you get. A global model fitted to the entire data set, maybe however difficult to be to interpret, 
and it may well hide or incorrectly describe the actuating physical mechanism. I mean, this curve here has several hundred parameters, and so identifying what is really the, the reason behind uh, this curve may be nearly impossible. If you look more careful, you see that uh, there are differences. As we said, actually, uh, now um, the parameters, the materials parameters have another uh, coordinate, x2, which in this case can be a or b, or that means circles or, or squares. So now this is part of the materials data set, not of the property as it was before in the other example. The property is now the y-axis. So we have two features. Uh, uh, we have the, uh, oops, what is this? Uh, we have actually an x1 and we have an x2 value of all the data. And having actually the x1 and x2 value, and again in the spirit of subgroup discovery asking, are there data sets which with respect to x1 and x2 are special uh, in the conditions which we had discussed before, we can do the same thing. Uh, we will find, yes, there is a region. If x1 is bigger than point i than this, then we are here and we can predict, in fact, for these data points, uh, we can now do a, a, a special separate extra fit to make a description what the y value should be. So we identify groups. We know that these are groups and we can now use uh, also other methods to get a prediction for these data sets in the subgroup. Subgroups are statistically exceptional as you see it here and as you've seen it in the previous example. Now, everything lives and dies uh, with respect to what our parameters are, which we should use for optimization. You can also say what should we use for characterization, characteriz characterizing our material. The descriptive set of parameters is really the main issue because we are optimizing with respect to these quantities. And with subgroup discovery, as you will see, we will in fact identify what are the best descriptors. So the decision about descriptive parameters or features or in machine learning, you call this the representation, is really critical for the success. We need a good pool of meaningful feature candidates. This is where the science is, identifying what are the basic parameters describing the materials, which are in fact describing the materials in a way that they also um, relate to the property for the, uh, which we are interested in. Now, you know that in principle, and I mentioned that before, uh, everything is determined by the many body Hamiltonian. And there you would say, yes, uh, for sure, the atomic positions and the nuclear numbers and the number of electrons, this is a full set of parameters. If I have these, then I have my Schrodinger equation. And in principle, everything follows from the Schrodinger equation. Of course, if I have a thermodynamics, then in addition, to having the energies which I get from the Schrodinger equations, I should also consider temperature and pressure. So these would be, if you are basic, uh, then you would say these are the, uh, the quantities I, I definitely would need. And in principle, as a machine learning person, you would say these quantities should be sufficient to fit your model. Now, Obviously, this is too far away from the true detailed mechanism because that includes everything uh, which can, can happen. Um, if we have a special focus, say we want to study superconductivity or we want to study electrical conductivity or heat transport, then we should use for sure parameters which are related to the atomic positions and the nuclear numbers. They should be, of course, also easy to calculate because you want a coordinate system at the end which you can create easily. But 
they should be closer to the mechanism. No, no, we don't know the mechanism, so we have to be as general as possible. We should offer more than maybe what is necessary. But this should be atomic ionization potentials, for example, the spread of the atomic wave functions. So giving more information about the atom than just the nuclear number, giving uh, uh, the nature of, of the orbitals, because we know that the orbitals at the end form the bonds, this type of information we should provide. And then the uh, subgroup discovery me mechanism or technique should tell us what is in fact really relevant. Let me explain what I just have said in, in one of the examples which I wanted to discuss, namely um, identified, and I call this here identifying the genes of materials properties by artificial intelligence. And it is our toy model, which you have seen before. It is um, um, the example of the uh, 82 octet binaries, asking which features decide on the ground state structure. So if you give me two atoms, from the octet binaries, can you predict uh, what structure these atoms will assume without, without doing a measurement or without doing, uh, say, a full ab initio calculation? Now, we know these octet binaries uh, are assuming either the zinc blended structure or the rock salt structure. Actually, they also you, uh, assume, to some extent, both sides, but that is. Uh, extremely close to, to zinc blender. So we will not distinguish here in this talk. So we say, will these structures which we have assume a zinc blender or both side or a rock soil structure? And you see the structures are very different. One structure here, this has four nearest neighbor. Here, every atom has six nearest neighbors. How can we use subgroup discovery for this identification? So the data which we are using are the energies for rock salt and zinc blender. And as we said before, uh, we optimize a so-called quality function. Now, um, again, this is a classification example because we have two circles and squares or zinc blender and rock salt here. The quality function, we are using essentially what I had before namely the so-called normalization, the normalized information gain, uh, which is the uh, entropy of our subgroup minus the entropy of the sample, sorry, the, the, the entropy of, 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 the, of, of all the data which we have minus the entropy of, of our subgroup uh, divided by the entropy of the whole data set. And the Shannon entropy is, as we have seen it before, given by exactly this formula which I've which is the same as you've seen before. And again, very similar as before, we just have two values, uh, circles or squares as we have it here. And now we do, um, um, we start with, with our actual calculation, but we need to, as we said, and this is the crucial thing, tell with respect to what parameters. What should be the X axis be? What are the parameters? that determine uh, this, what are the, the physical meaningful parameters determining really the, the, the uh, crystal structure of these systems. And as you said, it could be the nuclear numbers, uh, but uh, it could be not really the atomic positions because we want to basically predict the atomic positions, at least this, this, the symmetry of the structure. Uh, but it could be uh, things which are it should, should be things which are close to the atomic properties, atomic properties which determine if a system likes to get ionized, if a system likes to get uh, in, in certain type of bonding without really get giving this information what bonding it, 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 it really is doing. So we are using for this for this analysis here 52, 55, 55 different structures, which we offer in subgroup discovery for this analysis. So we're using a lot, knowing that this is many, much, much more than, than we really need, but we want that subgroup discovery tells us in what of these parameters do we find really these subgroups. 
And these parameters are the ionization potential uh, of, of atom B, the electron affinity of atom B, the HOMO level of atom B. These are all atomic, so we don't use any information of the solid. Uh, the LUMO level of atom B, the uh, value, the RS value, actually, uh, that means the wave function. So, so these, these atoms have S and P and D wave functions. These wave functions have uh, an, an outer maximum, and we basically give the position uh, of the outer maximum because that tells us about the spread of this wave function of the S level, of the P level, of the, of the, of the, the wave function, of the D wave function of the atoms. Ionization potential of atom A, basically everything we had for B, we're also using, of course, for A. And then we're using also uh, derived quantities. That means differences of uh, ionization potential A and ionization B uh, and differences of, of wave function extension and so on. So altogether with uh, initial uh, parameters and derived parameters, these are 55, as we said. Um, they're all listed here. I don't really go through this. And then we asked really our machinery, and that is in this case a Monte Carlo uh, approach, look for all these 55 conditions or, or uh, uh, parameters and look if these parameters should be smaller than a certain number, bigger than a certain number in a certain range and so on. And we leave this open and let the Monte Carlo decide what in fact should be the best solution. And um, this is what comes out. Now, let me just really go to the green area here before. So we find that the conjunction for being rock salt, so this is the rock salt structure, for being rock salt, the P wave function extension of the A atom minus the P wave function extent of the B atom should be bigger than 0.91 Armstrong. And the RS, the S value, the uh, S wave function of, of atom A should be bigger than 1.22 Armstrong. So from the, um, from the 55 parameters which we offered and which we used for, 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 for analyzing, for the analysis, only two have been really selected. Uh, this RP minus RP, RPA minus RPB uh, value and the RS. This is basically, if I, if I use this now as the X and Y axis, so the X axis is exactly this RPA minus RPB and the Y axis is this RS. If I use it as the X axis, this is this square, actually rectangular, not a square, rectangular, and you see Every point, so prediction of subgroup discovery would be every point in this rectangular should be a rock salt structure. And what I've plotted here are the points where we had numbers and in fact, uh, everything is really more or less fulfilled. And similar for um, the uh, zinc blender structure, we find that uh, the same quantity should be smaller than 1.16 or uh, smaller than 1.27. And this is this rectangular, which are two rectangular, which is slight overlap. That doesn't really matter. In fact, in this case, there's no, no, no data point there. And if you look at these, these, these squares, uh, so at, these, at these rectangulars, you see there are only circles here and there are only uh, 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 squares here, and that means both predictions are 100% pure, and that of course means the entropy is zero. So this is the best you could actually achieve, but you also see that there are three points which have not been really caught. I mean, we are optimizing uh, in these parameters, and we uh, then select, in this case, the 100% pure situations. Uh, we have two points here, uh, magnesium telluride, sodium, silver iodide, and, and copper fluoride, which have been not classified, but one should say that these uh, materials have uh, an energy difference between rock salt and the zinc blender, which is very close to zero, it's less than 0 0.01 electron volt.
So this would be actually my, my uh, uh, example, which I wanted to describe. And I have another example, but uh, because of time, I think I would like really to skip this. And uh, there will be a similar ex example later uh, by um, Lucas Fopper uh, in his talk. Uh, so, so I think we can skip this in, in this. This is a quantum chemistry example um, for catalysis. Now actually have to go through this. Uh, I'm sorry, I should have, okay. So let me actually summarize my lecture uh, on uh, subgroup discovery with then only one example from material science. Uh, subgroup discovery is a method for pattern discovery for identifying statistically exceptional structures and for finding physical characterizations. Now, in fact, I, I, I was a little bit fast. I forgot to say that uh, when, when I discussed the example for the uh, rock salt zinc blender structure, the physical characterization, right, you have seen that at the end, the parameters which were chosen from all the parameters we had offered uh, were physically meaningful. I mean, there were the extent, the, the, the extent of the S and P wave functions, which played a key role, which in fact tells us it's the nature of, of, of SP3 type of hybridization, which plays a role. And you've maybe also seen in this, uh, in, in the numbers, which I've shown you, there was some asymmetry uh, with, with, uh, with A and B. And that is actually the asymmetry was because of the learning was done asymmetric because it was always the cut ion was left we had gallium arsenide and we had not arsenide gallium. So we had a, actually a little bit of a, of a uh, bias, if you want, in, 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 the, in the elements. And that's why then also the parameters at the end were asymmetric. But the important thing is uh, they had a physical characterization. In fact, this is what um, is sometimes called materials genes. And I come to this actually at, at the end of this transparency. So let me just really go through this and coming back to the characterization and to materials genes. What I wanted to say is that this work on subgroup discovery was uh, started and in fact is still continued together with Yilis Vreken, who will give a talk on interpretability and uh, causality uh, later. And Mario Bolai, uh, who, with whom we actually still closely collaborating. Mario, actually we are collaborating with both, but on subgroup discovery and outlier detection, uh, we are working really with Mario, who is now uh, a lecturer in uh, Australia. And uh, everything I've told you was really done in, in very close collaboration with him. Um, if you want to see maybe a little bit more, uh, uh, recent work. Uh, so what I discussed today is published in, in, in a paper together with Mario. Uh, I would say Mario was really the key brain, uh, but also uh, 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 some additional in interesting material on, on, on what is just discussed has been submitted by him just last week um, in, in this second ex uh, publication, which I list here. Now we experience a deluge of data, but most data may be in fact irrelevant for the question of interest. And this is where subgroup discovery really comes in. In many cases, we may know what is relevant if we know actually very detailed, if we have good information and knowledge about the mechanism. But in many cases, in fact, we don't know. And for example, in the, case, in the example which you see later in this talk, in, in this lecture, uh, if, you, if you talk about heterogeneous catalysis, there are so many intricate mechanisms which play together that you cannot really make an easy prediction, even not uh, by, by advanced computations. What material is better than, than the other material? So things are very, very intricate. So in many cases, you will not be able to distinguish the relevant data from the not so relevant data. But at the end, and that is and the other thing, if you really could do this either directly because of your 
domain knowledge or you do it by subgroup discovery. What you then in fact will find that, that typically uh, the data which we have are big, but the relevant data are not. Identifying these relevant data and only fit those is somewhat the goal uh, uh, created or, or, or attempted by subgroup discovery. That means, and that is also important, we are looking at exceptions, but we are not collecting individual outliers. The important thing is we are identifying subgroups. That means coherent subsets of data that are defined by a concise description. That means by rules. So that's also why actually in this, in this uh, paper, which was just submitted by Mario, uh, he calls this optimal rule boosting. It's essentially subgroup discovery, which identifies the concise descriptive rules. The primary features of these descriptions are analogous to genes in biology. I wanted to say that before, but I forgot. Well, you have seen these rules, which are Boolean conditions. The RS value, the, the wave function of the A atom, the S wave function of the A atom has to be bigger than a certain number. And, and the other thing has to be such and such. These are very basic parameters describing the material, but they have the influence on certain properties. And that's why we say these primary features of these descriptors are analogous to the genes in biology as they are related to properties and to processes that may trigger or facilitate what we are interested in. But we don't know, in fact, if they are really promoting it or not, right? I mean, they could really trigger a mecha an, an effect. They can just make it easier, but they also can hinder the effect, very much like genes do in our body. So we have identified the parameters which are relevant for the function. We haven't identified the exact relationship because the exact relationship is given, in fact, by the many body Hamiltonian and statistical mechanics, but we have identified what triggers or facilitates or hinders the effect. And that, in fact, enables us to make a description of a situation which is even so complicated that you could not put it down in terms of simple analytic equations. So with this, I think we are back to the empty green board and we are at the Q and I uh, session and I like to hear your questions and I will try at least to answer them. Thank you.